as I mentioned, we are continuing kind of like the, the dive in to digital transformation in a pretty large company, AT&T. And onto the stage, I'm very happy to kind of like welcome my boss, Magnus Hillista, the person who opened this whole thing yesterday. And with him, Scott Gens, which is another heavy hitter, like seen a lot of things for decades. And who better to kind of like take us into to this um, topic? So yeah, welcome up. <laughs> Huge applause. Thank you, Knut, and thank you, Samira, for a great talk and uh, for showing everyone what you're building at AT&T. And thank you, Scott, for being here. Yeah, well, great to be here. Yeah, we've been looking forward to this. And we've been actually chatting about this. We, we met about a year ago and started talking about not only the technologies, but, but also how you get it done. And, and uh, this chat is called an executive fireside chat. Maybe it's a bit uninspirational. But I think the, the purpose is to talk about how do you get there? not what you're building. And there is no better use case to talk about that in such a big company like at and I remember when you contacted us um, about a year ago, first thing I thought was like, oh, at and that's going to take a lot of time. <laughs> I, I, do they even want to do this? I, I, rem I remember that. There, there, was, there was immediate uh, intrepidation with uh, tackling. And, yes, yeah, I remember that. But then I remember meeting you. And it was clear already then that you knew exactly what you wanted. And uh, you, were on a, you, were, you were destined to make that change at AT&T. How did you get to that insight? How, wh when did you see that you needed structured content? You probably didn't call it that. But tell, tell us about how it all started. Sure. Well, I, I think for us, it started you know, even way back when we started pivoting from monolithic apps to single page apps, right? The, the complexity of maintaining a scale, large sites, you know, AT&T, we have over you know, 4,000 microsites. We have product teams, we have marketing teams. Uh, we have content that's shared across all these different channels. So to do that at scale, Right, uh, our pivot started even way back when we started decoupling and breaking down these huge, you know, monolithic apps into smaller SPAs, and we realized that we had to start breaking apart our our platforms and making them more flexible and easy to use and easy to build. Right, so, and I think about that time, you know, it wasn't too long afterwards where you know microservices started coming about, where we we're decoupling and creating more, you know, fine-grained APIs. Right, so. Uh, the UI space is, follows a little bit you know, behind the back-end technologies, uh, and eventually we realize, hey, these same principles apply at the front end. We have to start decoupling. We have to start breaking things down. And we got to a point where we realized that content was a very key ingredient to that, that, that we had to treat content in a way uh, that we were treating our, our UI development and, and break it into these you know, more smaller pieces and, and put more structure so we have the flexibility to, to you know, uh, do great things with it. Was, was this something you spoke about across teams within AT&T or was this mainly engineering sitting thinking these, these tools don't work for what people expect us to do? I, I think there was a, a lot of pain points across all the, the areas, right? I think from a technology perspective, you know, obviously performance, you know, with these large head full applications not performing well on the web. Uh, I, I'm not too, you know, we're, we're not too proud to admit that at one point our dot-com site was extremely slow three, four years ago. There was a lot of head full uh, applications in there. Even today we have over 80 third-party libraries running on dot-com. So to, to build sites uh, uh, that can adapt quickly and be performant was a key concern. But we also had pain points with, and I think you know, Samir was talking about that, the handoffs between CX to UX to UI, right? It's a very long, lengthy, desegregated process. So we knew that we had to unify, we had to change our thinking around how we tackle development and content. So all those things started to come together and we realized that we had to look at it more holistically. Mm -hmm. So, and you were early. And I think a lot of companies that are there right now. And I think a lot of them see talks like Samira's talks and think, I want that. But 
realizing it and starting to realizing it within engineering, maybe see the pain points in marketing, but then to get there and to move such a, such a big organization like AT&T. But I think the same must be true for a lot of other, especially incumbents, I think more so than, than new fast growing companies. Um, where did you start? How did you, I think organizationally, not technologically, but where, where did you start to port, approaching this problem and start to figure out the path to actually get to that transformation? Right. Well, I think it started with us uh, when we started thinking about, you know, at, at scale, how to build uh, these different presentation layers and to really look at the tooling and stack. Uh, we brought in, you know, we revamped our design system and we started adopting a more componentized building block approach for building the presentation layer on the web. And then we started looking at, you know, how do we collapse these tools that are feeding into it? You know, we have uh, our CX team coming up with these wireframes that are handed off to our UX team. The UX team is taking specifications and then walking those over. So we started looking at how do we start collapsing the tools? How do we start thinking about uh, the experience you know, sooner in the process? And I think that led to us exploring how do we you know, take our technologies and kind of align to that to start to, to develop in that, and think in that manner. So it was, a, it was a, a change in thinking, a change in our uh, looking at our roles. And even today, I, I'm still even listening in the last few days, the different tops of discussions, I'm thinking about what is the role of a content producer or writer in the future. I, it, I think it's evolving as, as these tools and technologies evolve. So. Yeah, I think we'll see, we're gonna see changes in the organization. And th thinking about organization there, because you, you saw the needs, you saw how you can start taking these approaches, again, on the technology engineering side. Did you go out and, because this initiative came from engineering, seeing the pain points other places, yep. right? Did you go out and make a roadmap and start to convince people with, with um, maybe not the word structured content, but kind of similar kind of thoughts and, and paint it out like a two-year roadmap and started to make business case for executives and, and see who was on board and not? Or how did you, how did you get it moving? Yeah, I think initially it was, or, you know, we looked at our objectives with our experiences. I think, um, you know, Samir kind of touched on this. Like in the past, digital was all about online. Today, I think that's evolving where a digital is anywhere, right? How do we take the customer experience to the customer where they're at in their journey, whether they're talking to a, a virtual chat bot or they're online or they're walking into a brick and mortar store, right? So we started thinking about the customer journey and how we wanted to tailor the experience. And then we started looking at how do we make our experience consistent for the customer because our customer experience is our brand. It used to be, you know, our icon is our brand. Now it's our customer experience. Our digital experience is our brand to our customer. And customers want familiarity with their brand, right? They want to be able to come back. They want to know that, that we know about them in a way that they can uh, feel like that we're listening to their, to their intent, whether it's purchasing something or solving a problem or learning about something online or through a store or through a chat agent. So that kind of changed our mindset of how we tackle, tackle and think about our, our platforms. Does that mean the brand team was someone that, which air, whose area you got early when you were talking about the benefits that, did you have certain teams inside AT&T, other peers that you went to that, that supported you in kind of changing up all these things. And you, you not only came from a big vendor, you came from like the old monolithic market leader, right? right so right. You, you kind of had state of the art technology. Right. Who, who did you get support from? It? Well, we, and we, just because uh, my organization, we, we work closely with the brand team. So yes, we partner very closely with the brand team and uh, our marketing teams uh, do a lot of, you know, uh, experimentation, so th they're a very good uh, partner to try out the hardest use cases, right? Because they're introducing so much differentiation in our online experiences. They're actually, I joke about it, but they're breaking our design system all the time, right? They're pushing the envelope of how to present content in a way that differentiates it, that, that can be customized contextually to their customer. So. We, we definitely engage with those those teams because they brought us the hardest use cases. They brought us the things that we need we needed. To, they had the most complex challenges to them, and we we knew we had to tackle those earlier on in the process. 
And, and how did you go about, how to go about the business side? Because some of these systems cost money, but most of all, all these processes cost a lot of money. And, and there are huge teams working on, on developing and, and, and iterating, and you already had significant resources inside at and which is not true for a lot of companies don't have that, so they need to argue for establishing it. But how did you go about expressing the, the, the business value and expressing the, the benefits that you would get out of moving there? Did you paint that early on, or was it just so much pain that it was a general acknowledgement of moving that way? Well, I think, I think it was, it was well known the pain points that we were looking at. Like, how do we get to the market faster? How can we uh, reduce the amount of content that we have to maintain in, in multiple places? Like, we could tell that, you know, a customer was coming online, they would see one offer, and then they would come into a different channel, and maybe that offer wasn't quite, you know, contextually aligned with the other channel. So we, and we knew that was because we were, uh, you know, authoring and maintaining content in multiple places. So we knew there was problems that right away that would help us to, you know, improve our consistency experience-wise and also be able to get the market faster and be able to adapt to our marketing needs and be able to get things out quicker. So I think those are the drivers that help us to, to move where we were and align the other team stakeholders with, with the business value of what we were trying to accomplish. So we are able to take those and put them into metrics and actually calculate them over to, to money? Um, I mean, it, it, that's part of the ongoing challenge with this is like, mm -hmm. how, do we, uh, how do we measure? Like we can't manage what we can't measure. So how do, we, uh, how do we measure what we're doing? And we're still evolving in that regard. So even with our content, how do we, how do we measure, uh, you know, for example, with UX and marketing, with all these differentiations of, of layouts and themes, how do we quantify that? How do we look at the return on investment on what we're doing? Are we innovating and not really gaining any value out of that? So one of the things that uh, structured content is allowing us to do is to be able to tag metadata to our content so that we can track and, and, and uh, measure a customer's interaction with that content and be able to associate intent with what they're seeing and what they're interacting with. So that, that's a very exciting area for us to be able to, to leverage that, to be able to, to measure and quantify what we're doing. Mm, mm. But there's no, there no like couple of simple metrics or things that trickle down to actually business. This is what we often see, it's, it, it's hard. There's, there's not a couple of numbers that your executives again say, okay, if you if this is what you could promise me, you deliver. Well, then, obviously, then you can go ahead, uh, yeah. Scott. Obviously, they're looking at click through rates and conversions, and those things yeah. are are important. But uh, also, also our customers are they are they satisfied? Are they are they finding relevant mm. content quickly? Are they are they engaged being engaged with the intent that they uh, they're desiring when they interact with us? So so. Uh, yeah, I mean, it, it's difficult to boil it down to a couple simple metrics. And, uh, work. How about risk? There is, there is risk in doing this. You're putting in a lot of the technology is inherently very young, and there are few being early moving into this. There are, there are a lot of people who have done it already, but there are a lot of people who, who haven't. And we speak to many, I speak to many customers who either themselves or there are a lot of people that are skeptical in the organization because they see the risk. Could we, could we improve a little bit what we have? Because it's painful, but yeah, we know, we know what it is. And, and we all hear about this blowout IT projects that, right. that, uh, that spiral out and doesn't, doesn't deliver good, uh, good results. What, what were the typical, uh, were there discussions inside at t then, like the major risk and how did you handle that part? Yeah, I mean, any time you pivot to a new way of doing things, there's a risk with adoption and, uh, you know, uh, different stakeholders understanding how their role is being impacted. Like, we had a lot of discussions, and we engaged earlier with our content implementers to, uh, to vet out how we're rethinking about content so that, uh, you know, they're not looking so much of the structure of the content. They're more focused on authoring experiences and working with, uh, you know, like, like Samir said, being able to pre preview the content in different form factors, being able to see how their end product looks, right? So 
they were very much still working in this old mode of operation where they were thinking about how to structure the content and we're like no we're going to take care of that we're going to we're going to we're going to structure the content behind the scenes but make the authoring more simple for you and of course there's there's uh you know that fear of like okay now am i losing control because of now i can't manage and manipulate the structure right so uh, there, there's a lot of stakeholdering and and education and and getting feedback on how uh, you know different roles are working with content or the user experience so so yeah, there's a lot of risk with that. And uh, uh, I think it's more about, again, talking about you know, how does our different roles change with the way that we're thinking and how we're interacting with content. So, And, and you brought them in early. Did you bring other people in early or did you have to do this a little bit hidden because of skepticism or, or, or risk? Uh, I, I mean, we're very, we have a very open culture at AT and T. Uh, trust is very open. You know, we, we don't do things. We don't try to do things discreetly. Uh, um, but obviously, you know, we're still learning. So we didn't want to like roll out everything all at once. I mean, when you're talking about, uh, you know, organizations of like 4,000, 6,000 plus, if you do something all at once, there's a, a great risk of like, uh oh. Because we, we've learned a lot. We've rolled back on certain things where we just hyperextended. When we first started uh, deploying, we did a lot of hyper configuration on our components where you could go in and do you know, different layout changes and configuration. And that led to a lot of complexity with our content structure. And we're like, OK, let's roll this back. Let's not put so much fl hyper flexibility into it. Let's think about content variants. Let's think about how we can use metadata to drive decisioning around what to show, you know, and, and those are those are just painful lessons that we that we thankfully did at smaller scale instead of going all in at larger scale. Something that has struck me in our discussions over the last year is how you, you know, Mark and Dresden say everybody should be, you know, everybody, every company should become a software company. I think that's more in the way of how you work than actually what you're providing. Um, and this ability to iterate and experiment to move forward. It seems to me like something in your culture that must be very helpful in when moving these big organizations over to these new, way, new ways of, uh, of working. Right, yeah, I, well I think innovation is important in any aspect, but uh, so we allocate a certain amount of time to, to innovating on how we can do things and we know that we're not always going to be successful, but we're going to learn from those innovations. So that's a very important aspect. And, and it, you know, as a technologist who doesn't like to innovate, right? So, yeah, and, let, and let's let's bring it back to technology because there are some people say that the problem in this industry isn't the tools, is the way of working and the implementation of these systems. So there will be some people saying that all these new technology, give it a couple of years and we'll have the same problems. And there are technologists to say now we can do it. I know that you're, you're you're balanced. You spoke about new ways of working. What's your take on? on that? I think it is a balance. I mean, obviously, as a 30 plus year technologist, I, I focus first on technology, but I've learned over time that culture is important, how people think, different perspectives on things are very important. So I, it, it's definitely a balancing act, right? Not everything is going to be technology driven. We have to think about, you know, how the roles are going to evolve, how uh, uh, our teams are going to work in the future. Uh, I think that's there, there, there's going to be a continued ev evolution of how, how we work and how we build things, and it, it's exciting. And uh, but we can't just we can't get caught up in technology. I think sometimes we put these blinders on and we want to solve everything with a with a technology solution. But sometimes it's it's good to step back and and look thing, at things holistically. And uh, one of the things I liked in Carrie's book where she talked about using domain driven design to think about how to tackle a problem and and we're really latched on to that like we've even extended that using like behavior driven design when we're when we think about modeling content and user experiences because now we're not just thinking about you know like Simon was saying yesterday where you have a you know you're just dropping a, a piece of content into a template it, let's think about how that customers interacting with that with that content in point in time whether it's at an online site or a virtual agent, right? So thinking about how the customer is interacting with our with our experiences is 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 going to open up our minds to how we can structure things and build things and uh, approach things. 
Yeah, um, I'm with you. I also think organizations are going to change, and you're going to see new roles popping up. And we haven't we haven't really. Seen, I think we spoke the other day that you haven't had seen new disciplines or new roles being created, but you could easily see that happening also with, oh, yeah. inside AT and T. I think we have a lot. Uh, we have a lot to see there on the organization side. How about how about technology, state of the industry? What are the what are the big pain points you think of the of this bleeding edge technology industry? What what do we have to solve for this to become more widespread and easier to pick up? Yeah, um, I, I'm really excited about what's happening in industry on the edge, and uh, you know, obviously AT and T is is. Uh, and we put our, pushed our technology to look more at edge. We're using Next.js in our stack. We, we, we look at content as, and present and experience is just not static. There's more dynamic. So uh, as we look at and think about personalization, we're thinking about how do we use you know, AI and ML to uh, you know, drive models that can interpret how customers are inter interacting with our experiences and our content. And then use that to uh, come up with models that will actually train and maybe at some point in time uh, recommend content variants to our customers. Mm -hmm. So those are things that are changing the way that we're thinking about our technology and, and, and how to drive things to the edge and leverage the, you know, the great things that are happening there. Yeah, yeah, edge, edge and AI and personalization. I know you're, you're, you're um, preoccupied with that and I think this whole structured content topic brings it in, bring in, in metadata and just enabling machines to do the job for us will take us there. But, right. but we, do have a long, we do have a long way to go. Um, I wanted to finish off with uh, a couple of rapid, like, two things. So um, what were the two main objections from people that were not supportive of your plans, and how did you get around them? Uh, I think, you know, uh, there was some, I think, concerns about like, okay, we're bringing in structured content. Does that mean we're going to be less flexible in how we design our experiences? Are we going to have more of a rigid thinking around, you know, and our designers and our user experience folks, they desire a lot of flexibility with, mm. with how they, uh, you know, present things and experiences. So I think there, you know, whenever you see the word structured, it doesn't always in translate to flexibility, right? So I think those were some of the, the things that we ran into, for sure. Mm, mm. How about for, for someone watching this um, at a company dreaming about moving the company in that direction, uh, seeing the light of structured content, what are two things you'll recommend them to, to do as they, as they think about starting a match? I, I wish that we had done more uh, domain and behavior driven modeling like we you know it's hard to think of all the different use cases but as we evolved and we started thinking about uh, I'll give you an example with uh, we do point in time activation offers right for our customers whether it's a retention offer or an upsell, upsell cross sell we were looking at it from a point of online and then we're like we started talking to our our, uh, our virtual chat teams and they're using Google, Google dialogue flow right and then we're like, oh, why couldn't we take this concept of an offer and use it within this intent model, right? So then we're like, well, that definitely changes the way that we're gonna structure our offer. So then we went back to our offer structure and the content and we started thinking it with the context of how we could show an offer in a chat. So I think taking a step back and looking at all the different use cases is very, would be very helpful in, for, the, for, the, for the folks that are like starting down this journey. How do you know the balance of that? Because you also, some things you probably have to iterate on as you move forward, but how, how do you know when you spend too much time versus too little time going into this, <laughs> this model and try to make it yeah, perfect? It, yeah, I mean, you try to future-proof yourself. I think, you know, I always use the, the rule of three. If, we're, if we've got three different layers or we've got three different processes, if we've got more than three of anything, we're probably boxing ourselves in, uh, mm. but we, we try to future proof, our, proof ourselves uh, to some degree. We've we created separate models that we can, you know, maneuver and manipulate and evolve. Um, and uh, yeah, there's there's always that those things that you can't foresee. And it's hard to, to cover all the use cases and, and no. you know, so. So be thoughtful, model, model the domain, think about the content models, think about what you want to do, make sure you have flexibility to iterate. Yeah. 
Um, that's one. Do you have another good advice for people embarking uh, um, on this journey? You know, uh, I, I think, too, one thing that we're starting to think about, too, is how does data, customer data, fit into, like, you know, the content model and not just the presentation, but, like, merging all those things. So we do have, like, a, a back-end from front-end pattern where we do a lot of orchestration. So now we're thinking about, you know, how do we intersect these things? How do we take, you know, the presentation, the customer data, the content, and, you know, what are some of the things that we can do with that to uh, make our experiences more contextual and more relevant? Right, and more personalized. So, so, so start thinking about those things. How do you how do you intersect all those those different you know data points? And, and in what way do you think? What what is the challenge? Because this is a, this is something that structured content and and machine machine readable content really enables. But what what's the um, if I were to go back to our company and think about this? We're a different kind of company. But someone want to go back to a company and think about this. Well, how, where should it start to think about? They, they have all these different data sources, but where, is, where should you start looking in order to figure out how you can approach your data with your content? Well, again, I think it goes back to, you know, what is the presentation of that, of that data? What is the customer experience? What, how can you make that experience more relevant, more contextual? That drives how you need to pull the different data together, how you want to uh, integrate it or orchestrate it within the experience. You know, I, I think just having that, you know, that vision into what you want to do with your experience is key to that. Mm. Let's finish off. I had, my final question was two, two things you wish you would have done differently, but you already said one of them. What, what other mistake did you, did you do or things you wish you would have done differently that others can learn from as they started? Um, I, we spend quite a bit of time focusing on web because that's, you know, our that's our main bread, bread and butter for customer traffic, uh, and we do look at you know native and other channels. But I, I wish we we would have taken a, a especially I like focusing more in retail and our agents. Surprisingly, we've learned a lot more about uh, how our like co-browsing experiences with our our call centers or our retail stores, how they're interacting with that content and the customer at the same time, it's, it's entirely different, right? It's now you have a third party uh, individual that's working on the behalf of your brand to interact with a customer. So looking at their problems, their challenges of trying to disseminate what the customer wants and what the knowledge that they're getting from these various systems, has kind of opened our eyes to, you know, nuances of how we structure content and data to support what they're doing. So I think, you know, look at all your different channels, not just get fo hyper-focused on, you know, web, although web is, you know. Uh, the web's the future, we heard earlier future, today. I don't yes, disagree, I, but but there's still apps. And I, I think that might things. be the case, yes. The the reality of, 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 uh, of um, of, of life is that you, you have, we heard from New York Times yesterday, you know, kids don't use iPhone, they use iPads, and you have to, you have to live with that. That's right. So, so what you're saying is, is, is really about the domain modeling and the content modeling and really understand your business. You have to evolve a lot, involve a lot of people. But you have to still think about where you're gonna go with it. You have to think about the kind of data you will, you will um, drive in. You should think about the different platforms you have today or you may have, I don't know how AT&T think about metaverse, maybe that's a conversation for afterwards. Uh, yeah. not, not here now, but um, so you, you have to look at these different things, but, but then go back and plan the, uh, the, the content model. And maybe that's the, that's the main takeaway, bring people along, plan on the content model, think around it, be thoughtful, right. and then iterate. Right? Iterate, yes, always. That's, Thank the, you. that's the key. Thank you, yeah. pleasure to have you here. Yes, great to be here.